here mm -hmm. with uh, Pete Weldon, the incumbent, and Todd Weaver, uh, challenger for uh, Winter Park City Commission seat four. Um, we appreciate both of you being here. Uh, a third candidate, uh, Barbara Chandler, uh, was invited um, but didn't respond to our, uh, our invitation, so she's not here. Um, but we, we appreciate your time. Um, I'm Mike Lafferty. Um, I'm the opinion editor here. Uh, Jay Reddick is uh, the person who uh, is also on the editorial board. He mostly, um, a lot of his job is selecting and editing the letters and the guest columns that you see um, in the Sentinel online and in print. Um, so thanks for your time. Sure. Uh, we'll have about an hour. I have to confess that it's five minutes till 12. I have to get up and leave and go to a different part of the building to do something that is time sensitive at 12 o'clock noon. Okay, that's so good news because I do too. <laughs> okay, great, great. Well, that works out for everybody. Um, the, um, I thought I would just start by asking uh, Todd Weaver if um, you want to take a minute to make the case about why uh, Winter Park needs a new city commissioner. I'd be happy to. Um, it's been evident for some time that um, our commission has lost its balance. Um, I believe a collegial body should be five independent voices. Um, they are not. There are three. Um, there are three uh, members of this commission that vote in lockstep um, on controversial issues. Um, normally, the way a collegial body should work is uh, with a five to zero vote, and that means all the details of every issue have been worked out to everyone's satisfaction. They've had the time to talk to constituents staff, other stakeholders, and um, come to an agreement. And we do that most of the time. But there's 10 to 15 percent of our issues that come before the um, commission that aren't voted that way. That's always a three to two vote. Um, there are angry citizens as a result of it. And I don't think it's necessary. And by um, taking Mr. Weldon off the commission, I believe I can bring that balance back. Okay. Um, I'd like to give P. Weldon a minute to make the argument about why you should stay on. But I, I had a follow-up question first, though. What's, what's wrong with split votes? Um, I mean, some people might argue that unanimity, unanimity all the time is not such a great thing. Understood. Um, I, Keep in mind, I'm a former developer. I still have a general contractor's license. I first uh, received that in 1988. I've developed properties here in Orange County and Marion County. And my partner and I uh, made it a habit of always working within the guidelines of whatever county codes uh, we were working in. We never asked for a variance. We never asked for an up zoning. Um, we never asked for any special favors from elected officials. And the outcome was when we left a project, the neighbors were very happy with what we've done. Um, the neighborhood over time improved because of our initial investment in the communities. And we're very proud of that. We also walked away with a nice profit. Um, what we're seeing around Winter Park is a lot of pressure on these three commission members from um, development interest. Um, I have nothing wrong, I have no qualms about redevelopment. There are some advantages there, especially our stormwater specs are more stringent now than they used to be. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure issues that we're not dealing with. Um, we're losing employees to less affluent cities because they pay better. We've lost um, quite a few police officers over the last few let years. Me, let me stop you there because we're going to get into some of these specifics. Okay. I think I was really just sort of honing in on, on the what's wrong with uh, uh, split votes from time to time. But anyway, uh, let me turn to Pete mm. Weldon. Um, can, can you give the argument about why, um, uh, why Winter Park residents should uh, keep you in office and maybe also address you know, the issue of split votes and unanimous votes? Sure. Uh, first, let me address the issue of uh, split votes. If anything is true about Winter Park, almost everything is controversial. Uh, the fact that we have uh, virtual unanimity on probably 90% of our votes 
is uh, to be applauded in terms of the fact that uh, all five of us uh, share the same goals in terms of keeping Winter Park special and keeping our character intact. Uh, the implication from Mr. Weaver that there have been uh, uh, changes or uh, approvals of rezonings and higher density allowances than allowed by code, it's not borne out by the evidence, and I have some evidence I'd, I'd be happy to go through, but I won't waste the time here, I guess, or spend the time unless you want to hear it. Uh, uh, but we have not increased density. In fact, my leadership uh, is clear that I have decreased density by removing R4 zoning, uh, which is the highest density zoning allowed in our, in our uh, zoning code. Uh, from availability, uh, no one can ask for a rezoning to R4 anymore because of my leadership, and I think that's a very tangible change that refutes Mr. Weaver's perception of uh, what has gone on. In terms of why... If I interrupt you, what's, sure. what's R4? Is that R4 what is 25 units per acre. It's the highest density residential code in Winter Park, and it, it was removed from new consideration. And in other words, nobody can apply for it anymore. The only way it can be uh, uh, achieved, or well, let me put it another way, the only way that a developer can ask for density higher than R3, which is 17 units per acre, is to request a comprehensive plan change, which entails the, the longer public notice, the submission to Tallahassee, to allow the citizens more time to react to any major changes in our comprehensive plan. Okay. Uh, uh, so that's, that's the answer there. Thank you. Now, in, in, in terms of my contributions to the city and why I you know, want to continue to serve, is that uh, the next question? Uh, well, yeah, the basic question is why, why voters should keep you in office. I have been very proud and uh, pleased with the results of the past three years on the City Commission. Uh, VotePeteWeldon.com details a litany of improvements and investments that we've made in our city uh, that have added significant value to our city. I believe I have demonstrated a rational and uh, sensible policy priorities that allow us to not only invest in the city, but also to build our financial strength simultaneously. If you look at the reality of things, uh, we've increased our unrestricted general fund cash reserves from $8 million to almost $14 million projected at year-end September 30, 2019. At the same time, we've invested very significant dollars in 55 acres of new green space, improvements to our tennis facility that are first class, improvements to the Azalea Lane uh, 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 playgrounds, improvements to Ward Field, improvements to Ward, uh, to, to Show Walter Field, improvements to Ward Park. The list is almost endless, and it's a question of focus on reinvesting where it makes sense when we have the money and building value for the future so that we can react to hurricanes and other opportunities, in fact, that may come our way so we have the money to buy new parkland, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I'm very proud of that, and I look forward to carrying that forward. Okay. Um, Todd Weaver, if I could ask you, um, what, what, uh, what votes or positions has, uh, I think you're about to get into these a, few, a couple moments ago, has uh, Mr. Weldon taken that you would have done differently had you been in office? Well, one of the things um, that... Um, Mr. Weld and I disagree on is financial management. Um, he touts a 40-year experience in that area. I run two Winter Park-based businesses, very successful businesses, um, based on inventions and uh, engineering um, expertise. But um, even though I've never taken a formal business course in my life, I see um, inconsistencies with how the city budgets have been uh, manipulated over the past few years with Mr. Weldon's approval. Um, one thing I would have never voted for is the um, rearrangement of our tree ordinance. So for many years we had a tree ordinance that um, had fines associated with removing our canopy trees and um, those were all borne by developers. So um, just before Mr. Weldon was elected to um, the commission by a very narrow vote. He had spent some time on the Tree Preservation Board and uh, recommended significant changes to that ordinance. Um, the tree budget is still something that the, the city has to finance. 
and previously about three hundred thousand dollars a year um, was put forth by that fund from fines and so forth. Um, now what's happened is that three hundred thousand must still be covered. So the way um, under Mr. Weldon's leadership that happened was a hundred thousand dollars was taken from our SunRail fund, a hundred thousand from our sewer and water fund, and a hundred thousand that. Um, came from other utility funds. Um, I don't agree with that. I think it's fuzzy math. Um, you know, when I go to buy a set of tires, I know that it's not $99. There, there's valve stem and balancing and, and all these other things that go along with it. And a financial manager is good at manipulating accounts, but I don't do that as an engineer. I don't run my businesses that way. It's very straightforward and our businesses are very easy to audit. Wait, so you're saying there's like 100 k that's been taken from several different funds to go into some tree fund, and how's that tree fund spent? What are you um, we, we have quite a few um, uh, damaged trees or older trees. Um, some, a few of them may be diseased, but um, the city has a, um, a very good responsibility to take care of trees and medians and rights of ways and uh, generally the planting for the young trees is done by our arborist program and um, that three hundred thousand uh, dollars funds those efforts. Okay, can you, can you kind of just quickly tick off a couple of other things that um, and then you'll have a chance to respond that Pete Weldon has done in office that you would have done differently, and if you could keep them brief, that'd be great. Sure. So he mentioned the R4 and his leadership on getting rid of that. The truth of the matter is, is we had a, a large apartment complex um, on Denning Drive called the Paseo that was very controversial. Um, massive density, um, maxed out uh, lot coverage, very little green space. Um, uh, with that comes traffic issues and stormwater issues that are um, had to be borne by one of our parks, Martin Luther King Park. So what actually happened is um, every 10 years a comprehensive plan is submitted by state law by each city and when we were rewriting that uh, comprehensive plan another commissioner, Carolyn Cooper, actually separated the mixed, or excuse me, the um, um, R2, R3, and R4 designations, duplex, medium density, and high density into three separate um, subjects in, in that comprehensive plan. And that was the only way the city was uh, able to get rid of R4 because otherwise it was all under one umbrella of um, high density or you know, mm -hmm. apartment type uh, homes, mm -hmm. non-single family homes. So for Mr. Weldon to take responsibility for getting rid of R4 is disingenuous. Okay, could, could you address wow. that or oh, wow. whatever I, else? You I don't know address. what to say after that. There are, um, I hope the Orlando Sentinel will investigate the facts uh, on what Mr. Weaver's claims are here. Uh, at first, in his response, you know, my, in, my instinct was to say, I, I'm not sure Todd is aware of all the things that have actually happened after he accused me of manipulating the budgets, that's totally untrue. There's no transfer of 100000 from sewer budgets anywhere regarding trees. It's nonsense. You're saying that's just not happening? It never happened. Uh, I don't know where he got the idea. I don't know why he brought it up. Uh, it's irresponsible to mention it, frankly, in the context of, uh, of, of the truth of my leadership. I would uh, like to point out that um, on, in the city commission meetings of December 12, 2016, a discussion ensued regarding R4 zoning, motion amended by Commissioner Weldon to remove the high-density residential policy from the comprehensive plan and to make appropriate adjustments for those properties already receiving the benefit of high-density residential under the existing comprehensive plan. Seconded by, by Commissioner Sprinkle, it was approved unanimously. Um, also, the facts will show that the mayor in that summer uh, specifically credited me uh, in the city's newsletter for my leadership on that issue. So uh, to, to claim that I'm disingenuous is really kind of a reverse of, uh, uh, you know, it twists the truth dramatically in my view. Uh, uh, let me uh, uh, try to return to, to the question that you want answered specifically. What is, uh, you know, what other aspects, you want me to rebut him further? Uh, uh, no, we want you to take another minute. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about that or if you just want to move on to something else. Well, you, you, happy to do that. he brought up some issues of things that he disagreed with me on. Okay. Uh, uh, 
uh, all of them, all of his comments don't represent any factual context that I can document. Uh, I don't know what to say, frankly. Uh, in response, I don't want to be, uh, you know, personal, uh, but I think someone's got to look at what he's, he, he is telling himself and he's telling the public and correct the record, frankly. Um, uh, t can I, I mean, you say 100,000 is coming out of these budgets. He says they're not. I don't, what's yeah. true? Well, it, it's quite simple. Um, he gutted the tree preservation ordinance and um, basically got rid of all the fines. So that program still has to be funded and it has to be funded from the general fund or city service um, budgets. So um, we can talk about where the money came from, but it, it is fuzzy math and it had to be funded. But you and said it came it, from three specific funds. I have seen evidence of that, but okay. still, it's it's an account management thing. I don't run my businesses like that, but that is the prerogative of a CPA um, type arrangement. Our city manager is a CPA, and he has to make up these budgets from somewhere. And uh, without those developer fines, um, it has to come out of the general fund. Hey, so back to excuse me, Pete. Sure. Um, back to the uh, R four commentary. That very um, agenda item, that was actually item eight on that agenda where um, Pete Weldon did indeed um, raise that motion. And just item nine on the same agenda, he introduced a new mixed use code and um, later on became or developed into an overlay over entire. Um, Thoroughfare, which is Orange Avenue from Fairbanks down to 1792. He did introduce that to the record. Public record shows that. Um, right now we have a, a newer um, economic development director and he has been tasked with coming up with a new code for mixed use. We already have mixed use in Winter Park. Three very good examples, Park Avenue, Hannibal Square, and Winter Park Village. Another very good example that everybody loves is Downtown Winter Garden. Uh, I remember when I was at UCF what Downtown Winter Garden looked like. It was very blighted. The shops were not um, doing well. There was a few restaurants that were just hanging on and due to um, some very good planning on their city staff, they've developed this wonderful economic engine that duplicates what we've done on Park Avenue over the last 130 Is years. For, for what's your point with this? Well, the point is, is no one knows what these mixed-use um, codes look like. Um, I've talked to a couple of the other commissioners. They have no idea. Several people on city staff have no idea. So another example of mixed-use that doesn't work is downtown Maitland. So they're building large apartment complexes. Uh, there's been one called the village at Lake Lily, um, shops on the bottom floor, large apartment buildings on top of that. And during that time, 80% of those shops have never been rented because it's on a major thoroughfare. That type of mixed use development does not work. I am not for it and the citizens of Winter Park are not for that. Do, do you want to jump in and talk about mixed use for a while? And uh, what, what that's yes. About? <laughs> I would like to talk about the tree ordinance first and then mixed use, if yeah, that's okay, all right. Sure. sure. Yeah. And, and I'd appreciate equal time on that one. Well, uh, I'm not keeping a clock. So I understand. I'll, I'll do my best. You let me know when, I, when okay. I'm over done. Uh, on the tree ordinance, uh, yes, uh, the tree ordinance used to fine people tens of thousands, well, not tens of thousands, thousands of dollars and as much as maybe $15,000 for a specific kind of tree in order to improve their property on an equal basis with their neighbors. Uh, for example, if you had a 24-inch tree in the middle of your backyard and you had and you wanted to put in a swimming pool, the city would charge you $220 per diameter inch uh, in, uh, in a fine in order to have a permit to remove that tree to put in your swimming pool. I, I made two changes in that ordinance with, with the unanimous agreement of the Tree Preservation Board almost 10 years, well, 2012, I think. Uh, the first material change was that if a tree was within your buildable area and you had plans to build, your, your requirement for a permit was to replace that tree. And if the tree is larger than, I think, 24 inches in diameter, it's two three-inch trees for replacement. 
So that automatically replaces the canopy that's being taken out without finding our property owners. He refers them to, he refers to them as developers. Uh, many individual homeowners uh, uh, were paying those fines. Uh, the other very significant change that I led the charge on with that ordinance actually adds more canopy over time. And that is the old ordinance used to allow the arborist to, uh, to permit the removal of a dead, dying, or diseased tree without any compensation, without any replanting requirement. I thought the right balance was give our property owners reasonable rights within their buildable area to manage their desires for their property, but let's add back a replacement requirement for dead, dying, and diseased trees so that even those now require a replacement of one three inch tree, thereby assuring the long term canopy on our private property. I think that's a sensible pop I think that's a sensible policy. I won three years ago in large part based upon the reasonableness of that policy and I find it amazing that someone wants to go back to finding our citizens. Uh, on the uh, on on the mixed use, um, we had a debate at uh, the Chamber of Commerce last Friday and uh, Mr. Weaver brought up the attractiveness of of Park Avenue and Hannibal Square as examples of mixed use that, that were acceptable to him. Uh, my consistent uh, uh, message, which is in writing over the years, including my service on the Planning and Zoning Board, has been that that is, in fact, the, 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 the excuse me, compatible model for Winter Park. That the greatest, I, we can do mixed use like Hannibal Square and Park Avenue, and, and the citizens of Winter Park will find that to be an attractive addition to our community. It's not a gift to developers. It's a way to leverage the character that we all know works in Winter Park so as to add value for the people who live there. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, last Friday Mr. Weaver said that the citizens and he were terrified about even talking about it. I don't think that's leadership. You don't lead by terrifying your own citizens, you lead by setting an example of what's possible and by having a positive view on what we can accomplish, not what we don't want. Um, I wanted to ask both of you about Sunrail. Um, mm -hmm. We have a very busy station there in Winter Park yep. and I wanted to know whether or not A, you support Sunrail and B, whether uh, you uh, will continue supporting it when the City of Winter Park is going to have to start paying part of the operating costs in a few years from now and since you just went, Todd Weaver, can you address that? Sure. Um, I've always been a proponent of Sunrail. Um, I uh, supported our uh, former legislator, um, uh, Micah, uh, because of his support for Sunrail. Um, I've worked in uh, Europe and Japan and Singapore and places like that that have wonderful train systems. In fact, school kids even ride them. Um, Right now, Sunrail um, doesn't have a real good destination, but thankfully, Winter Park is the number one destination on the whole line. It's a great uh, economic, or part of the economic engine for our Park Avenue and, and our ever-expanding downtown. Um, I'm a big proponent. I serve on the uh, League of Women Voters Transportation Committee. I meet with um, local, county, and state officials to um, enhance that, enhance ridership. I've been pushing for a link to the airport. Um, we already have four rail bays at the new terminal. Um, that part of it is set up. Brightline is supposed to um, complete their rails um, in that area and connect to uh, a more southerly station on the Sun Rail line. Right now we have a, um, a Lynx Express bus that you can pick up at at the Sunrail station. Let me ask you if you can get to how, what about Winter Park paying its share? Well, we, we are obligated to do that. Um, we made an agreement with the state and I support that agreement. Um, you know, it, like I said, it is an economic driver for our downtown and I believe it serves the people well and we want tourism um, to come in and out without loading up our roads with cars. Do you know how much your share is going to be and where you would get that money? Um, <laughs> that's a very good question. That's something that we'll have to um, negotiate as commissioners. What, the, the amount or where you're going to get it? Where we're going to get it. What's the amount? 
Um, I've heard figures from 350,000 to 700,000 a year. Okay. And again, a, a lot of it has to do with ridership. Okay. So, P. Weldon, what about Sunrail? Do you like it? Where, how are you going to pay for it? Uh, it should be a fantastic asset for our entire region, and um, I would like to see Sunrail management do a better job of marketing it. Uh, the uh, I certainly support it. I supported it when it was uh, on the table politically several years ago, about six years ago now, I guess. Uh, I believe it is an economic generator <coughs> for downtown Winter Park, and it's been you know, very well received by our local businesses for obvious reasons. Uh, the specific number is between three hundred fifty dollars and $400,000 in terms of the city's contractual obligation. I don't recall if it's three hundred fifty or three seventy five. dollars I think it's one of those two numbers. Uh, uh, the way the contract works is that uh, the city has the option not to participate or to pay that on an annual basis. In terms of funding, every year since we did the agreement, uh, the city manager has set aside within the general fund reserves one year, or he's been accumulating the money over seven years, so that at, at, at the end of the seven-year period, which I think is 2021, May 2021, uh, the city will have one year <coughs> worth of funding already locked in. Uh, now, the CRA... Uh, will expire in 2027 and uh, it, it's generating cash right now that I believe may be available to fund the Sunrail obligation on the part of Winter Park. Uh, certainly when the CRA expires in 2027, uh, somewhere between two and a half and three million dollars worth of incremental tax revenue will be coming to the city's general fund, which is more than enough obviously to meet a $350,000 obligation and uh, over the next couple of years I've already asked the city manager for a study of uh, of exactly what the financial and the operating realities are of Sunrail and I'm looking forward to that and, and to monitoring that between now and 2021 so that we can have discussions with Orange County about <coughs> general funding sources that may be available et cetera et cetera but uh, on the table right now is the city's obligation uh, mm -hmm. for 350 to, to 375 thousand dollars okay wanted to swivel over this way. I'm afraid here I've been dominating things. Oh, no. Have a oh. question or Lisa, uh, if you want to jump in with a question. I'll jump in if I need to. Yeah. Okay. Jay? No, I, I'm good for now. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the one issue that I did come, come into uh, this discussion with, and Mr. Weaver, you, you uh, addressed it a, bit, uh, a little bit, was the Paseo project, and I know that that was a big driver of, of controversy and debate and everything else um, I did notice in, in both of your questionnaires that, that you did address traffic um, what are the solutions there it's it's hard to look at Fairbanks Avenue and say how are we going to help uh, help ameliorate the traffic that's going on there but then you've you've got everything else going on with uh, with traffic all over town what are the the incremental steps that need to be taken to uh, to fight that that question is for me I will start with okay. you okay um, well the first thing that you have to do is consider population increase um, in Winter Park so um, random development is not a solution it's part of the problem and loading up um, high density buildings um, regardless of height or density along a major thoroughfare like Orange or Fairbanks is not a solution it's part of the problem so that has to be considered right up front um, unfortunately Winter Park is um, challenged geographically east and west we have you know a single artery that um, brings people from as far away as Oviedo to downtown Orlando. Um, I realize that that's an issue that's difficult for us to solve on a local level, but as I stated before, I am working with officials all the way up to the state level to develop those relationships to come up with solutions for the future. And um, just saying that it's a local problem is not a solution. We, we have to work with all of our partners statewide and regionally to uh, address this, but public transportation, um, biking, electric bicycles, all those things are part of the solution to keep more cars off of the, the roads. We can't keep adding cars and expect to solve the problem. 
Are you ready for scooters in uh, Winter Park? I am. I, I had a, a scooter um, when I was consulting in California. I used it because it was much faster than uh, driving some days. Mr. Weldon, what, uh, what do you have to say about sol solving the traffic issues, even though I know it's going to be an incremental mm -hmm. and long process? The um, the challenge is getting FDOT to prioritize Winter Park's interests. Uh, and that is that is reality. Now, there's a lot of frustration on my part and on, on the part of every resident, and Mr. Weaver has been uh, promoting that frustration politically to his advantage, uh, which I understand. Uh, but the reality is that there's very little we can do by ourselves, and there's a lot we may be able to do if we can deepen our relationship with FDOT and for that matter, Orlando and Orange County because of the relationships uh, of the roads to the population. Uh, with regard to his remarks about population, the entire thrust of, of, of my belief in removing high density apartments is exactly to manage Winter Park's population. It makes no sense, uh, well, uh, over the past, I think, 15 years, I wrote an article on winterparkperspective.org uh, about density and traffic and I believe the population over 15 years in Winter Park has grown 11% in total, whereas the population of Orange County has grown 25%. So, and most of that population growth in Winter Park is actually from <coughs> the annexation of Mr. Weaver's neighborhood, uh, as well as another one along Fairbanks. Uh, so I'm not for, I am not for uh, further annexations. I am for constraining the population to concentrate the value in our single-family residential neighborhoods and to provide services and amenities that leverage uh, our single-family character. If I could follow up, though. Sure. <clears throat> what was, you mentioned the, having a better relationship with DOT. Mm -hmm. Presumably, well, to do what? I mean, does that mean right. that they would shower sure. one park with money if they no. like you better, or what, what does that mean? No, uh, one specific case uh, is is that we, uh, I, I voted to approve a $600,000 investment a couple of years ago to put city-owned fiber optic lines out Fairbanks and out Lee Road, connecting our, pri initially, to to connect our, our key water, sewer, and electric control systems and the rest of the city's uh, and the rest of the city's operations together in a more secure network. But that, that investment will allow us to have an asset that we can deliver to FDOT and say, listen, we've got this. Let's tie together your signal, your signaling controls with our fiber optics and see if we can't uh, better manage the traffic patterns through the city. Uh, that's one specific example of something that we hope to be able to do that we made the investment with my vote to to uh, to try what about scooters like scooters I am uh, I don't know what the legal situation is with scooters as far as the state of Florida is concerned I am uh, I am open to allowing any resident of Winter Park or any visitor to use any form of transportation they find uh, desirable well I think the question is whether yeah if companies come in and set up shop and have these you know kind of free range scooters that uh, you know people can just well, rent and then I have around are you okay with that? yeah I've read some articles about certain cities have done that and the scooters end up abandoned on the side of the road et cetera et cetera I haven't studied the 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 consequences for the city of Winter Park no one's brought that to the city mm -hmm. commission or asked staff to deal with it yet uh, I would be very uh, conservative in terms of uh, the negative potential impacts of something like that, uh, but it's impossible for me at this juncture to say what I would do. So it sounds like you would be a little less conservative about that. Well, right? right now we're a college town. We have wonderful uh, Rollins College, and I've seen quite a few of the students use scooters around their, mm -hmm. their gas-powered scooters. But I am a proponent of the Lime bikes, the electric bicycles here. I think there's some challenges as far as where to park them. I've seen some of them in front of ADA ramps and so forth, and uh, that's probably not the best way to do it. But it sounds like they're becoming successful and popular. and. Um, they don't appear to be causing traffic problems. I haven't heard about any accidents or, you know, near fatalities with them. Um, obviously, you want to use them on appropriate roads and not the interstate. But, yeah, I'm, I'm a proponent of um, any kind of alternate transportation that works and gets people around without getting in their cars. Okay. 
In your questionnaire, um, you mentioned transparency. You said citizens are frustrated with the current administration's opaqueness. What did you mean by that? How does that opaqueness manifest itself in Winter Park? Well, the mixed-use um, zoning and the Orange Avenue overlay um, are of concern to me and a lot of my supporters. Um, I think that's an easy thing to bring out in the open to um, let the citizens see the progress of those codes being written. Um, you know, talk about the, the height limitations and um, back sets or, excuse me, setbacks from the streets, the width of the sidewalks, what the green space could look like, um, whether or not we're going to sell city property. Um, that's um, always on everyone's mind. But, but specifically, how is that being kept from people? Well, it's being kept from the commissioners, too. I, I've talked to two of the other commissioners, and they've not been privy to anything um, regarding the new mixed-use codes. And I, again, I, I think we have four very good examples in the area of mixed-use codes that, or mixed-use developments that work very well. They're good economic drivers. They're safe. Um, they have canopy trees. They have all these wonderful attributes that we love about downtown Winter Park, but there's some very bad mixed-use developments going up um, nearby, um, north of us along 1792. Yeah. That business plan does not work on, on major thoroughfares like Orange curious. Avenue. I'm just curious though about, I mean, is this, it sounds like you're saying the staff is working on this whole mixed-use thing, and but that they are somehow not um, revealing information that they're discovering to commissioners of the public in some sort of regular or timely basis. Well, so I'm I, just trying to get at what you're... I, I have had um, a couple of meetings with our economic development director, and the last time I asked about that, he directed me to the communications director, mm -hmm. which means um, I'm not to be told about it mm -hmm. to me. Um, so, uh, well, Pete Weld, I wanted to ask you about that. Do you feel like information is being kept from um, uh, from either commissioners or, or the public by the, uh, the staff? Uh, no, I don't. And, and in fact, the underlying problem isn't transparency of the staff or the commission. The underlying problem is, is a certain group of residents in Winter Park fear-mongering any discussion of it so that nobody on staff wants to talk about it because they're afraid people who support Mr. Weaver are going to uh, go spread no density signs all over the city again without any rational underpinning. Now, Mr. Weaver said, and I've said several times here, and the record shows back on my service in PNZ, for six years I have been trying to get us to talk about mixed use exactly in the context of the things Mr. Weaver says he likes. I, uh, Hannibal Square, downtown Winter Park, Park Avenue is a standard that the citizens of Winter Park should be talking about in terms of building similar types of communities on some of our commercial uh, land. He continues to fear monger my, my priorities as being something like what was done on Maitland. But I've but already said, on, uh, you know. But how is, how, I mean, you've used this term fear mongering. If, if you go back to, uh, to planning and zoning work sessions from years ago, to our, to our, to our commission work sessions uh, that are on the public record, you'll find that I consistently try to move forward staff and the commission to talk about these things. It becomes purely a political discussion and not a community discussion because no one wants to talk about it. I have been prepared to talk about it for six years, and I think it's a constructive conversation that the residents of Winter Park should have, free of the political badgering that comes about every time someone mentions the word development. Wait, so if, if this mixed-use issue, it sounds yeah. like a pretty hot issue in Winter Park. It always has been, right? yes. Okay. Um, so why not have, like, town hall meetings where people, or have, maybe you've done this, yeah. where people can come in and talk about um, what's on their mind right. about it? I mean, what would... What, over the years, we have had those things. We, yeah. in fact... Uh, when you say over the years, like, yeah. how long ago? Uh, well, the last one I remember was we had a uh, planning the possibilities thing maybe seven years ago, roughly, and it was a huge public involvement, and it didn't go anywhere. It was like $300,000 worth of city money paid out to consultants that resulted in zero. Now, I'm not trying to force the issue. I don't demand... You know, I live there, too. I... I'm not going to be voting for something that negatively impacts my quality of life. I'm just saying let's have a conversation and uh, every time someone brings that up, 
the reaction is you're hiding something and it's just not true. And you know my standard, my standard is the same as his. It's Hannibal Square and Park Avenue, and I think that's consistent with the desires of uh, the residents of Winter Park. We all sound like you're on the same page on that. But yeah. I did want to ask you specifically yeah. about something from a couple of years ago where yeah. you you and other commissioners were meeting one-on-one -on -one with the city manager. Um, I think they, the meetings were during the day when right. a lot of people were working, right. um, and uh, they were noticed, but... You know, some people thought, I hate saying mm. some people because that's overused, but there was criticism that, right. you know, this was a way to skirt the Sunshine Law. Right. So uh, why, why did you agree to do that? Because I was asked meetings? and because I want as well, much... You could have said no. I could have said no, but I want as much public discussion as possible, whether or not it's one-on-one -on -one or three-on-one -on -one or two-on uh, or four-on-one -on or all five of us. It, if some commissioner wants to talk to me in public on a notice meeting, I think it's a service to the citizens to record it, you know, which it was, and to get to know what has actually happened in terms of our communication. That's the requirement of the Sunshine Law. To say that uh, one commissioner invites the rest of the commission to a work session that they want to have and only one other person shows up is somehow a violation of the Sunshine Law, it's just not true. Uh, I. I relish the opportunity for every citizen to call me and, and speak with me and speak with the other commissioners and encourage us to, to have public meetings and on to understand what they want. That's, that's the purpose of the Sunshine Law in terms of controlling and channeling the communication uh, uh, to the public when it comes to specific decision making. Are you all still doing those meetings? Uh, nobody has asked for one in two or three years, I think. Okay. At one point, the mayor, uh, I, 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 I believe, asked to meet individually with each commissioner and that that's what caused the uproar I think uh, on the part of the First Amendment Foundation okay. which, which oddly enough uh, would not uh, reveal uh, who it was uh, who uh, uh, who was complaining about the fact that these meetings were being held so you know it, it goes both ways. Can you respond to that? I mean if, you, if the mayor asks you to uh, have a meeting that is noticed but is not in the course of a typical meeting, is that something you'd be uh, comfortable doing? Um, probably not. I, I think one-on-one um, -on -one meetings like that are um, a gray area of the Sunshine Law. I've, I've been under Sunshine Law um, mandates for, let's see, Orange County was four years and Winter Park was six years on advisory boards. and. Um, uh, you know, going back to the, the mixed use thing and, and mentioning Hannibal Square, obviously Park Avenue was developed over 100 years ago, but Hannibal Square was developed under what's called a C2 code. And uh, we already have commercial standards in place that control mixed use. And I don't see any reason why we need a new code unless there's something nefarious going on. Um, Hannibal Square, everybody loves it. It's it's appropriate. The heights are right. The trees are there. The sidewalks are walkable. And again, it's on a, a very uh, quiet set of streets, and that's what good mixed use looks like. Um, Douglas Grand is another example. It's a very large apartment building, but it has the shops on the bottom floor on a quiet street, and it works. So, I think this whole mixed use thing is is a waste of the city's time, and. Um, the fact that it's not out in the public and um, we haven't had workshops. I've attended many workshops. In fact, one of um, Mr. Weldon's um, developer donors um, had a, a, a workshop that I attended that had our entire executive staff at it. Probably cost thousands of dollars and the outcome of it were multiple comprehensive changes for his Ravidage development, multiple variances, um, uh, multiple rezonings of small properties that he bought up in the area that he hadn't got before. So again, it's disingenuous what Mr. Weldon said about um, this, you know, um, needing a mixed use. Um, that you know, we haven't changed the comprehensive plan. We changed it a lot in the last year. I've been to every single commission meeting except for two, and I've seen dozens of comprehensive changes and again they're almost always by three to two votes. But what about that? If you have a mixed-use 
code that's worked for you over the years? Why are, yeah. you, the, why the, are you changing The it? C2 Thank code you. would work, uh, with the exception that it doesn't require enough green space. Uh, you know, we can take the C2 code and build on it. It's, it's a 200% floor area ratio, and it, it's basically downtown Park Avenue uh, uh, and a few other stretches on New England and uh, maybe Canton. But at any rate, uh, that could be the foundation for a workable mixed-use code that the citizens of Winter Park would, would find acceptable and compatible. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have all of the elements of, uh, of what we could do in terms of uh, sidewalk dining and green space allowances and other planning criteria that are part of a broader mixed-use concepts that have been applied elsewhere in the country. For, for, for example, a winter garden, as, as Mr. Weaver points out. And I think we, you know, I'm all for exploring that and talking about it publicly. Uh, you know, the, the use of the term nefarious to describe our, uh, uh, our, our, our planning processes and, and associating it with me is just you know, absurd. We, we only have a couple of minutes left, sure. um, so I just wanted to invite both of you to say something in conclusion, whatever sure. it is you care to say, as long as it's hopefully not something the other person needs to respond to, <laughs> because that'll yeah. uh, take more time. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Weaver, you want to start? Well, I bring a unique skill set to the commission. I'm a general contractor, aerospace and mechanical engineer. I'm a businessman. I'm a, a stock trader, um, I'm a former developer. Um, all those things are important for city planning. Um, and Mr. Weldon, again, claims to have 40 years of ex financial experience, but I'm also a scientist. Um, I, I, you know, uh, back politicians and issues for many years. I'm a, an unapologetic environmentalist. I've been a member of the Nature Conservancy for 29 years. Um, I'm proud of all those achievements, but again, we need a balance. We need um, a more informed commission, and I think I can bring that skill set to the commission and, and uh, get our city back on track. Okay. Pete Weldon, you want to? Yeah. Um, our city has never been in better shape financially, socially, and in terms of the quality of the assets we've been able to invest and bring to the benefit of our citizens. Uh, uh, from the standpoint of my background, I have an MBA from Duke University. I was the vice president and CFO of a Johnson & Johnson operating company that I helped start in the surgical laser business. I, I ended up down here in 1989 because I was recruited by a venture capital firm to run a, uh, a startup here. and. Uh, uh, I later earned the Chartered Financial Analyst designation and was an investment advisor for some 20 years. Uh, my entire focus of my career is value creation, it's, uh, and I've been able to create value for myself, my family, my employees, my customers, uh, my clients, and I relish and have been very appreciative of the opportunity to, to, to create tangible value for the city of Winter Park, and I urge people to go to votepetewelden.com to see what that is. Briefly, uh, I voted for and initiated many policies and investments that, that have added to long-term value creation we all want in Winter Park, from promoting a focus on forestry management for our street trees 12 years ago and now measuring the results, which are very positive, to pushing to move our electric undergrounding forward at a faster pace, to our agreement to purchase 7% of our power from large-scale solar fields, to embracing and supporting our vision as a city of arts and culture, to purchasing 55 acres of new green space, an amazing thing that is uh, bigger than Central Park and our golf course combined. I have always and always will carefully study our options and strongly support sensible policies and investments that, that serve the best long-term interest of Winter Park. I, I can stop you. I think we're sure. almost out of time. You know where we are there. <laughs> yeah, I do. Okay. Thank you both for coming in. Mike, appreciate it very sure much. Sure, appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you very Lisa, much. Lisa, thank you.